Hello, I'm Haslinda Amin in Singapore. Like all carriers, Singapore Airlines suffered during COVID. Passenger numbers were down to near zero from what was and is fast again becoming one of the busiest carriers for international travel. Singapore Airlines is part of this small country's DNA, too important to fail. This is a conversation with CEO Go Chun Pong. Mr. Go Chun Pong, Singapore Airlines CEO, thank you for joining us on Bloomberg Television. Thank you for having me. The pandemic basically decimated the airline industry. $200 billion of losses, the equivalent of nine years of profit. But here we are, a recovery insight. Give us a sense of how Singapore Airlines has recovered from the two years of uh, crisis. It has indeed been unprecedented uh, for the airline industry and for Singapore Airlines especially. Given that we, are, we have no domestic market, we operate only internationally. So uh, if you look back, uh, way back in January of 2020, uh, when Wuhan first announced its lockdown, that was the first sign of, in some sense, trouble. Uh, thereafter, it quickly uh, deteriorated because the virus was spreading across the world and borders were closing one after another. Just to give some statistics, in January of uh, 2020, we were carrying about 3.4 million people. By the time we reached April, uh, we were only carrying 11,000 people. Huge drop. And our capacity was reduced to about 3% of uh, pre-COVID. It was a very, very tough time because uh, as an airline, we do burn quite a bit of cash. We still need to maintain our planes, uh, pay our staff and all that. So we were burning, the cash burn was about 300 to 400 million a month. So the first priority, obviously, is to make sure that we have enough, enough funding to outlast this crisis. So we, we went up to uh, various stakeholders and fortunately, uh, we got the support of our majority shareholders and all other shareholders to raise $15 billion. Um, one might ask why $15 billion is a huge amount of money to ask for. It was more than our market cap then. Um, and the reason really is because, precisely because we don't know how long this crisis will last, we want to make sure that we have enough money to outlast the crisis so that the organisation can be very focused on recovering and in making, making sure that we indeed emerge stronger. So th those were some of, the, some of the things, some of the early challenges that we have to handle. How confident are you about this recovery? Give us a sense of the kind of capacity you're seeing right now. So we see that um, the reason why people are not able to travel is because all kinds of restrictions being imposed, uh, closing of borders and all that. So as I mentioned in January, um, or rather in April, we were carrying only 11,000 people. But as we see the borders being open, especially from Singapore uh, and also major markets in the world, Europe, US, uh, around Asia as well, we see strong pickup. So by the time we reach March of uh, 2022, um, we were carrying in that month about 900,000 people. Mm. And when Singapore announced further easing of restrictions, removing of, um, you know, opening the, the lane to all travellers, all vaccinated travellers, and removing all test requirements, there's another big jump. So in the month of April itself, we carry close to 1.5 million. And looking forward, we continue to see very strong booking momentums. How much clarity do you have beyond this year? I mean, 61% capacity for June, 67% capacity for September. Uh, what are you looking at for the rest of the year and perhaps in uh, 2023? So we don't give projections. What is also important to point out is that we, we have prepared ourselves so well during the pandemic to actually put in place capacity at short notice um, that we can respond to any demand changes out there very quickly. So when we put in capacity in, in as you mentioned, in this quarter and that of next quarter, um, that is because we can see that uh, there is going to be greater opening out there and we can actually deploy our resources where the demand is 
and ahead of most of our competitors. In fact, in most cases, when the borders are open, we are almost always the first airline to actually put our capacity in and to announce sales. So uh, we, we are quite confident. Can you get to pre-pandemic levels without China opening up its border? China is obviously a very key market, especially for airlines in our part of the world. Um, we used to serve 29 points in China, in the greater China region, uh, the group that is Singapore Airlines as well as Scoot. Um, so if China is not open, obviously there will be some impact to the overall traffic for any airlines, especially in Asia. However, we are, we are also seeing um, demand, more demand from other parts of the world. And we are, in some of the cases, increasing our capacity more than what we used to serve. Where would these places For be? example, uh, New York. We used to serve maximum twice a day. We are now serving New York three times a day and twice a day non-stop. Ali, you talked about how you're planning to expand and to, to meet demand. Uh, one of the key issues is actually manpower. There's been a shortage. You've talked about how you need 2,000 more workers. You've mm. hired 800. Where are you on that? On Are, are you confident of, um, I guess, hiring the number of people that you need? The way we've approached manpower has been very different from most other organisations going through COVID and certainly most other airlines. Uh, we have been very proactive in managing this crisis from all angles. For example, I mentioned uh, funding. We raised the 15 billion very early on and were able to raise the rest of the 22.4 billion that we have you know, accumulated since the start of the pandemic in, from, from April of 2020. Um, with the support of the public, with the support of shareholders and also strong statement of support from our government. So those were all positive. We reached out to OEMs, share, uh, aircraft manufacturers as well as engine manufacturers and others to uh, talk about deferral of uh, a payment because we defer aircraft. Uh, this again is a proactive way to manage our cash flow. In fact, we managed to defer more than $4 billion in capital expenditure. We reach out to our people to take pay card, um, and they have all supported. I mean, I'm very appreciative of that. The last resort was really letting go of people for two reasons. One, because we know how difficult it will be for our people to get jobs during that time. You, 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 you can imagine everybody was having issue with business. You know, everybody was you know, closed down and so forth. And uh, we, we really do not want to let our people out in, in that kind of climate. Secondly, we also know that the recovery will come at some point, and our people very uh, truly is, is our most valuable, important asset, and we want to retain them. We are aware, of course, our investment in Vistara, and Vistara is now clearly established as the leading uh, full service carrier in India. What is the kind of growth you're anticipating for a market like India? It's going to be the third largest uh, market in the world. I'm not talking about in Asia, in the world, and that's after uh, China and the United States. Mr. Goh, there's some concerns about the quality of pilots. In fact, the Qantas uh, union chief has come out to say that, you know, for, uh, for a company like Qantas, it takes about 25 years, as many as 25 years, to get from uh, uh, first officer to captain. Whereas in some uh, companies within Southeast Asia, within Asia, it takes perhaps four to five years. I mean, what are your thoughts on it? Are, are there concerns to do with that? Our pilots, um, many of them have been with us for a long time, and they, you know, their their dedication to SIA can be clearly demonstrated during this pandemic, whereby they um, come together, take collective pain, and retain job for everybody, with almost everybody within the cohort, and that's the reason why we now still have a very strong uh, strength of pilots to uh, operate our planes. Uh, I think. All of us know, all of us within SIA know that uh, we can only grow if the company grows. 
So all of us are committed to make sure that SIA can continue to grow um, when the pandemic comes to an end. And we are seeing that happening already. I guess the question really is whether there are concerns about safety. Oh. And has the pandemic led to Ab compromises to do with not. safety? Absolutely not. Because safety is the number one priority for Singapore Airlines. And that has never changed, pandemic or not. So, um, for example, during this period, uh, while we are operating only, let's say, 60%, we're using up almost 100% of our pilot population so that everybody have a chance to continue to fly and be operationally ready. You talked earlier about how it was difficult for Singapore Airlines because it doesn't have a domestic market. Has the pandemic perhaps prompted you to reassess how the business is done? Is there a need to diversify the markets? Is there a need to be in other markets apart from Singapore? It's not something that we do not know before the pandemic. And uh, firstly, we don't, of course, we don't have a domestic market um, unless you're talking about some kind of a joint right, which of, is just not good for, for uh, the environment. Um, so, so what happened is that from day one, Singapore Airlines do not have a domestic market and we compete internationally with the best out there throughout these 75 years. What happened is that we became extremely good at international competition in terms of our product leadership, service excellence and our network connectivity. We truly uh, is a group with international footprint. Of course, uh, we also realize that without a domestic market has its uh, challenges. And that's uh, and other um, changes, structural changes that happen in, in the industry. And that's the reason why uh, we had the portfolio strategy, mm. whereby we had Scoot, Scoot, of course, is in our LCC subsidiary. So we can always be very nimble in deploying the right vehicle on the right routes where the demand is either full service or, uh, or budget. The other thing is our um, multi-hub strategy. Uh, so you are aware, of course, our investment in Vistara. And uh, India is going to be, by most uh, expectation, the third largest aviation market by the middle of this decade. And Vistara is now clearly established as the leading uh, full service carrier in India and growing very well. Vistara, of course, is a tie up with Tata Group and Tata now owns Air India. Might that shape uh, your future relationship and might that mean perhaps SIA buying into Air India? Is when that I a possibility? Vistara, I should have foreseen that you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, and you will probably know my answer. Right, uh, we we really do not comment on any discussion. We on a confidential discussion we may or may not have with our partner. But what I can tell you is that both Tata Sons and ourselves are equally committed to ensure that Vistara continue to grow. What is the kind of growth you're anticipating for a market like India? Strong growth. Um, Quantify I just, that for I, us. I, I, I just mentioned how fast it has recovered domestically. And I also um, say that it is going to be the third largest uh, market in the world. I'm not talking about in Asia, in the world. And that's after uh, China and the United States by the middle or in some of the projections even earlier, by the middle or earlier of this uh, decade. Mr. Goh, as you talk about expansion, let's talk about your fleet. I mean, your, you've placed orders for the 777-9. Mm. That uh, delivery is not going to happen anytime soon. That's mm. been delayed. Mm. Uh, how are you planning to perhaps bridge that gap? So firstly, we continue to uh, take in new modern fleet with latest technology. And uh, that, that has to that do with sustainability? Been, uh, that has a strong sustainability uh, contribution because um, straight away you cut your emission by 30%. And in the case of freighter, by 40%. Uh, and that, that's, that's great. And of course, along the way, it also helped to save fuel, uh, which again is, is a great thing for the uh, airline. Uh, and 777-9 um, uh, is indeed, unfortunately, has been delayed. That's not much we can do as a customer. However, whenever we do our fleet plan, we always uh, build in some flexibility. So in this case, while the 777-9 uh, will be delayed, we are confident that we are able to make use of the flexibility within our current fleet to make up 
uh, for some of this uh, capacity deferment. How might your fleet look like 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road? It will be, we will continue to bring in new technology planes uh, because uh, it gives us not just, over, not just about uh, fuel efficiency, but it, it is also about uh, capability, range, size, plus also uh, in many cases, the new technology planes will bring about greater customer comfort which, of course, is absolutely important for us. So when it comes to sustainability, ESG, what is the strategy at Singapore Airlines? One of the key contribution and most immediate contribution any airline can do in terms of reducing uh, emission is really about bringing in new technology, new technology planes. I mentioned that comp we just do our own comparisons uh, with respect to our older generation planes our new generation planes were 30% more uh, efficient. And our average age in terms of uh, the fleet size for the group, uh, we are looking at about six years. That compares with industries of more than 15 years. You just can imagine how much uh, uh, emission we would have reduced by. A net zero world is also impacting the way people fly, especially the corporate world, mm. business travel. In fact, a lot of companies are trying to cut their emissions by half by 2025. How is that impacting, I guess, corporate travel demand for you and how are you looking at that? We have been very proactive actually in communicating all the sustainability, sustainability activities that to, to our corporate. Uh, and we have been emphasizing what tangible steps we have taken. A very tangible one, as I mentioned to you, is our new technology planes. Uh, in some sense, if you were to take an SIA plane to a destination relative to uh, somebody else who's operating old technology, straight away you have a, you know, immediate contributions to reducing uh, uh, carbon emission. So far, in terms of business travel, what kind of recovery are you seeing? We are seeing strong recovery. What is strong, Mr. Go? We've seen ticket prices surging. Do you expect ticket prices to stay elevated? There are opportunities uh, for uh, very competitive prices in, uh, let's say, beyond the next three months or so. In terms of business travel, what kind of recovery are you seeing and is that pace sustainable? We are seeing strong recovery. What is strong, Mr. Go? So, so just in terms of, we always, I think it's easy to kind of compare it relative to pre-COVID. So it is very interesting in the initial part of the opening when the VTR, when we have VTR with various regions, uh, we were actually seeing many uh, what we call premium leisure customers who are not really traveling for business, but going on to the uh, business uh, cabins. And um, primarily because they, they have not seen their loved ones and they wanted to visit and wanted greater comfort and so forth. But with this greater opening, especially the removal of the need for test, we are seeing corporate uh, bookings coming, get, coming back very strongly. And by strongly, we are actually seeing the same proportion relative to leisure travel uh, booking as what we saw, what we've seen, uh, what we saw in the pre-pandemic uh, situation. Or is it just about the initial pent-up demand? Of course, there may be some of that, um, but you know, business travel, corporate travel, uh, usually also grow in tandem with economic activities. And our part of the world, you, you are very familiar, uh, you, it's projected to actually grow faster than many other parts uh, of the world around, uh, many other countries around the world, many other economies around the world. So with that, we expect the uh, business uh, and corporate travel to pick up as well. It is a challenging environment, even as the aviation sector recovers from the pandemic. We have oil surging and expected to stay elevated for a very long time. Uh, is that prompting you to reassess your hedging policy? How are you looking at oil? We have seen oil prices, high oil prices before. I mean, the airline industry is not alien to many of these challenges. Just about anything that happened in the world affects us. But at a time when the airline industry is only beginning to recover and you're faced with high oil prices. 
So we, of course, have our own uh, we have our hedging that uh, will continue to provide some level of stability up to the first quarter of 22-23. Uh, we continue to review what the hedging policy should be relative to the uh, oil market uh, going forward. Bear in mind that the objective has always been to uh, provide some stability to manage the volatility and not to try to make speculative gain. We've seen ticket prices surging. I can testify to that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you expect ticket prices to stay elevated? Ticket prices is really uh, a function of demand and supply. And to be quite frank, um, you know, some of these collections we are passing on to the oil company. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't see a scenario where only the very rich will be able to travel? No, the way they, we used to are... see you know, 20, 30 years ago. There are opportunities uh, for uh, very competitive price prices uh, further out in, uh, let's say, over the next, beyond the next three months or so. Of course, there are traditional peak period, uh, and we're talking about June holiday and maybe year-end demand. But in between and further out, uh, there are competitive prices to, uh, to be able to, to be offered for customers to pick up. Mr. Go, the pandemic has obviously changed the way people travel. What trends do you see developing? The pandemic has, uh, actually at the very early stage of the pandemic, we begin to ask ourselves what, what kind of changes, what behavioural you know, different uh, requirements that our customers may have. And, uh, and we did surveys very consistently. Uh, two items uh, stand out. One is the concern over health safety. And for that, we, our team has gone through more than 100 touch points uh, that we, we have with our customers. And at every single touch point to ask ourselves, how can we enhance it so that the health safety aspects, concerns of our customers can be addressed? And we've communicated all that to our customers and that have been very, very well received. So um, the other aspects is really uh, about seamless travel. Uh, that is related to all the frequent changes in uh, border restrictions, in test requirements and all that. And they created a lot of frictions for our customers. And again, here we try to work with authorities, work with um, you know, our airports, our partners, to reduce that frictions and to try to make it as easy as possible. What has been the biggest challenge as the CEO of Singapore Airlines over the last two years? I would say two things. It, it, the right at the beginning is really to ensure that we have enough cash to survive. It is a survival issue. Uh, and, um, and I certainly do not want to see Singapore Airlines declaring that we have to go, go bankrupt and so forth. That's one. And fortunately, we were able to address that quite early and provided uh, uh, confidence uh, uh, by the financial markets in general. The second thing, which is, I would say, the most uh, painful decision that uh, I have to make is about letting go our people. We had to let go almost 2,000 of our people. It was very painful. We tried to delay as much as possible. We reduced the number as much as possible. In fact, as early as February, because we were anticipating that there could be a slowdown in the, uh, in the environment, in the aviation market, we decided to stop recruitment. Mm. So we let natural attrition uh, to take place and we didn't do the actual retrenchment until September. So those were, those were very difficult uh, decisions. Mr. Go Chung Pong, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you again for having me.